Well, praise Jesus. What a beautiful day today. God is indeed good. We welcome you to Disciples for Jesus Ministry of the Apostolic Faith, and we are indeed built upon the foundation. According to Ephesians chapter 2 and 20, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We just want to invite you out to come and worship with us at 10024 Seasons Boulevard in Aurora, Illinois. Our services, our services at Sundays at 2 p.m. Well, with that being said, we just are so thankful and we love that scripture in Psalms 118, verse number 24. It says that this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, I looked at that word uh, 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 day, which is a Hebrew word that means yoma, and it means time, year. So this is the time. This is the year 2023. This is the time that God has blessed us. This is the day the Lord. And in that text, that word Lord means the existing one, Jehovah or Jehovah or Yeshua or Jesus. This is the day. This is the time that the Lord, the one and only true and living, living, existing savior of the world has blessed you to see this day, has made this day fast. And that word made means he has fastened this day produce this day to bring about is what it means he's made god has fastened this day just for you he, he brought about this day just for you to rejoice and be glad in it in spite of what you're going through you can still be delighting in the lord and be joyful about god allowing you another day to be in the land of the living well with that being said we want to tune you into our sunday service which was last sunday Sunday, September the 17th, and we just want to say to you before we tune you into the service that we're asking that you will continue to pray for us. We are starting a new church ministry, and we've been going for about six months now, and we are asking that you continue to pray for us because we are still learning how to adjust our recordings until the Lord sent in who's needed to help with the ministry that he has called us to do, and until the Lord add unto the church daily such as should be saved. But we will not despise small beginnings and we will remain faithful over a little that God will make us ruler over much. So we just ask that you will not just listen to the word of God. We ask that you will be attentive as you listen to the word of God, believing for it not just to inform you, but to also transform your life. The message is entitled, Why We Need Jesus. Well, greetings. This is the day which the Lord has made, and the scripture says that we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you so much for tuning in to Disciples for Jesus Ministry of the Apostolic Faith. We are indeed built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. We just want to go right into our sermon for today, which is entitled, Why We Need Jesus. Why We Need Jesus is what our sermon is entitled today. Now, last week we talked about this message, but it was not pre-recorded. But today we just want to take it from the beginning again on why we need Jesus. Now, when we look at that word why, it's meaning for what reason or what purpose. To need something is to require something because it is essential, absolutely necessary, and because it is extremely important. We have two scriptures that we want to read this afternoon in your hearing, which is going to be in John chapter number 3, verse number 16, and verse number 17. This scripture, John 3 and 16, is a well-known scripture by many throughout the years. I can't speak for the 21st century um, uh, generation that's alive today that are younger um, in their 20s and 30s. Perhaps they don't even know about the scripture, John 3 and 16. But there are many down through the years that are well familiar with this scripture. In John 3 and 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. 
Now we have to see the key focus there for whosoever believe it in him. Whosoever believe it in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. But the beauty of the scripture is the scripture afterwards, which many times when I was coming up, I would always just hear John 3 and 16. I would never hear verse number 17 when it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't first come to judge us. He come to show us how much he loves us. Now, when it's talking about the world, it's talking about humanity. It's not talking about he loved the trees, he loved the bears, he loved the cats, he loved the rats. He created all things, but it's humanity that has a spirit. It's humanity that has emotions like him and that can connect with him, that can speak to him, that can worship him, that can pray to him. He so loved humanity. God so loved the world. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, to judge the world, but that the world through him might, might be saved. That means based upon you believing in Jesus. Now, we're going to bring, in, bring an understanding to that how you believe very shortly. But there's a powerful expression that many people say, you, you, you need to believe in yourself. That's a popular statement that you can hear even now in our times. You need to believe in yourself. And it's okay to have confidence and not low rate yourself, have a low esteem about yourself, don't have no kind of integrity, no kind of pride, no kind of uh, 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 strength, to encourage, strength to encourage your mind, but to just believe in yourself and leave God out of your existence as far as surrendering and depending and trusting in Him is not what God has created you to do. But that expression is you need to believe in yourself. You need to believe you can do what needs to be done and accomplished in your life. There, there are some needs that we have to believe that we can do. Um, you need to believe that you can fulfill your educational plan. You need to believe that you can comprehend this lesson that seems to be complicated. You have to believe that you will get the mathematical equations that you need to get. You, you need to believe that you can get this promotion. You know, there are some things that people have so much fear. The opposite of fear is faith. And if you, you're either going to have fear or you're going to have faith. But the powerful thing about faith is when you have faith in God, when you have faith in trusting that God will do what he says he would do based upon if you will trust him as he teaches you how to trust him in his holy word. So some, there are some people that they see a young lady or they see a young man and they'd be like, wow. I would love to talk to her, or I would love to talk to him, but I can't see her even giving me the time of day. I, I can't see him even giving me the time of day. You know, you 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 don't you 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 have a, a different type of thought pattern about how you want to fulfill the need, which is really you want to introduce yourself to that person and let that person know that you're interested in them toward building a relationship. But once you get in your mind, I can do this. I need to let her know. I need to let him know how I. I feel about them. I've been down that path before, done that, and have fulfilled that need, and is happy about fulfilling that need. You need to be able to realize that I need to do this. I need to let him know. I need to let her know. Not that I want a fornicating relationship. Not that I want just a little te a temporary relationship. Not that I just want to drive by a sexual encountering, but I need to let them know that I'm interested in building a relationship with them so that I can begin to know them so that we can in the future be married as a a husband and a wife you got you have some people they they have a need and sometimes the need has been created to a point where they don't have a choice but to learn how to fulfill the need example all due respect but if a person is obese or if a person is undernourished and underweight and looks like that they are deteriorating and their bones are deteriorating then perhaps they find out in the diagnosis that they have a physical inner condition that is being expressed through the eyes of others seeing them from the outside and they have have to get to a point where I need to lose this weight. They get to the point of where they understand that this is essential. Remember that definition of why we must need. The word need is to require something because it is essential and it's absolutely necessary. It is extremely important. So that person makes up in their mind that I need to get this weight off of me. 
I need to stop putting things in my body that is causing me to go up the scale toward leaning toward being a diabetic or toward having high blood pressure. So we can go on and on and on talking about how people are determined or learning how to be determined or need to be determined to fulfill needs that really need to be met because otherwise you might not live to see a long life. But there is a reality check that everyone needs to accept today that God created us for his glory. He created us for the purpose for living to be an example to others how to please him according to his will so that others can see through us that they can fulfill God's plan according to his will. Now, when I say created for God's glory, you know, when people want some glory, they want some attention. You know what I'm saying? A woman fixes herself up and she gets up in the morning and she, for, for the first time, her husband gets up. She don't have her hair twisted. She don't have a scarf on her head. She just gets up and she's dressed in a different way. She just looks like she just wants to glamorize herself before she starts her day so that her husband can recognize how beautiful she looks outside of just seeing her just walk around the house looking any kind of way. But if she does this and she do it more than one time and he never compliments her, he never tell her how nice she looks, then she don't feel like she's getting no recognition. So when you're talking about glory, you're talking about somebody that shines. You're talking about somebody that's being praised, somebody that's being honored. And that's what God created us for, to shine for him, to show the world that I honor a real, true, and living God. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, glorifying your Father which is in heaven. So God created us for the purpose to represent him, to shine for him. Now there's a scripture in 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 20. Verse, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 3 through uh, and 4 that we want to read. Can I say that one more time? 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. That's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 3. This is good and acceptable. In other words, acceptable means this is agreeable. This is in God's plan. This is how he see that he wants to do for humanity. For this is good and acceptable, agreeable in the sight of God, our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord, our Deliverer. And 1 Timothy 2 and 4 says, for who will have all men to be saved. So this is God's will. This is what's agreeable with God. This is what's acceptable to God. He, he wants to see in the sight of the Savior, Jesus Christ, who will have all men be saved. Now, when God talks about being saved, he's talking about being delivered and rescued from something that has you not realizing the real need of how you can be set free from the bondage of that thing that you are controlled by in your life. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's pornography, whether it's lust, whatever it might be, it's, he's in agreement with changing your life through the power of the blood of Jesus because he will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Oh, hallelujah. So in other words, he wants us to come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, I want you to think for a moment when he says come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, we know that Jesus said in the prayer in the garden to sanctify them, separate them, distinguish them, sanctify them, set them apart, sanctify them through thy truth. Jesus said thy word is truth. So we know God's word is truth. And we know in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. But in all essence, even in the midst of the scripture that Timothy is being, that Paul is writing and saying to Timothy, who will have all men to be rescued, to be saved, to be delivered, to come into the knowledge of the truth. We know truth is the word of God, but write this down. John chapter number 14 and 6, Jesus said, and he, and he said this when Thomas and them was in their, in their perplexed state. You have to understand something. The, the disciples followed Jesus. They didn't really recognize the real need of how they was really going to need to be rescued by Jesus until after Jesus died. They followed him. They saw his miracles. They saw the things he'd done. But at the same time, they really still didn't believe that he was who he really said he was. He had James following him, which was a half-brother. 
uh, which is Hebrew and Jacob. He had uh, Judas following him, uh, which was one of his half-brothers, not the Judas that betrayed him. Um, but at the same time, they kind of saw the humanity part of the manifestation of God. They saw him work in miraculous ways. They seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw him heal Peter's mother from a fever, and she rose up and began to feed them. They saw him heal the woman with the issue of blood. They saw him with the woman that was curled over for 18 years. They saw him heal that woman. They saw when the man was in the tomb cutting himself and couldn't break out and was breaking out of the chain, and when he fell on his face and said, Thou son of David have mercy on me they saw how this man was clothed and returned back to his right mind but yet they still wasn't 100% on board with Jesus being who he said he was but after his resurrection their eyes open up and they realize that he was and he is and he still will always be the savior for humanity the one that can deliver you the one that can set you free so Jesus says in John 14 and 6 I am the way the truth and the light. No man. That's very now. This these scriptures. What I'm loving about these scriptures. Let's rewind. They are very specific. Everything about the Word of God. When you take your time just with one scripture and you really, really analyze that scripture, you really, really meditate on that scripture. You can take so many portions of one verse and cause your mind to awaken to the truth of what God is saying. Because Jesus said unto him, "I am the way." Now, he's, he, he's breaking things down. He's not just saying one sentence with just one general word that means everything in the sentence. He's saying, I am the way. That means I am the direction in which you are to go. In the Old Testament, it says a highway shall be made, and it shall be the way of holiness, and the unclean shall not err therein. They won't be able to get in no other way but God. Then Jesus said, I am the sheep. I am the shepherd. I am the good shepherd. If any man come in any other way, he's a thief and a robber. So now he's saying, I am the way. I'm the path. I'm the direction. I'm the one that can show you that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Then he turns around. He said, I am the truth. So he said, I'm the way. Then he said, I'm the truth. Remember, truth is God's word, and truth is demonstrated through the life of Jesus, how God's word can be alive and applied in our life as human beings. That's why God so loved the world. That means he so loved humanity that he gave his only begotten son. He sacrificed himself and became human like you and me so that he can bleed, so that he can be, feel the persecution that we would feel, so he can encounter the temptation that we would encounter. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So you got to go the right way. You got to have the right truth. And then you can live the right life. Oh, I wish we could praise God right there. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man. Now, this, is, this, is, this just totally deletes there's many ways to God. He said, there no man cometh unto the Father. Not the fathers. Not the gods. Not the idols. He say, no man coming to the Father, one specific God, but by me. Now, you can choose not to accept that truth, but it's still truth. And that's why we need Jesus, because he's the only way to God. So back to 1 Timothy chapter number 2, we read 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, verse 4. Let's close out with 1 Timothy, reading chapter number 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. For, now, remember what we said in John 14 and 6. Jesus said, I am the what? The way? What else he say I am? Truth. Truth. And what else am I? The light. Then he said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, we're going back to 1 Timothy where we started off saying, for this is good and acceptable, meaning agreeable, in the sight of God and our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, look at what he says after that. For there is one God. First, he said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the many ways to God is total deception. It's a false doctrine. And if they say it's all kind of ways to Jesus, they're preaching another Jesus. Then Paul said, let them be accursed. Let them be condemned. But he says in 1 Timothy 2 and 5, for there is one God and one mediator. Now, let's hold up there because we need to understand what we read. We just don't want to read without an understanding. One mediator. That means the go-between person. That means the person that inter intercedes for you. That's the person that represents you so that you won't be um, judged and condemned and killed. 
A mediator is someone that represents you so that they can get your sentence lessened. Or they can represent you in a way where you can't speak, they can speak for you. But in the case of Jesus, he's representing us. He's our mediator because he was a living sacrifice. He so loved the world, God, that he gave himself. He gave his only begotten son, that only, the only unique one, the only one that was born in a way that we was never born. But he was born the way God designed for himself to be born. Mary was overshadowed. And, and, and that seems to be complicated. Well, it should be probably even more complicated when he created Adam from the dust. And not only did he create Adam from the dust, but he put anesthetic into Adam, knocked him out, and turned around and opened up his rib, and then brought a woman out of his rib and gave him the first surgery, gave him the first healing in the garden. So God does what he does, whether we believe it or not. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So let's go back and go real slow. We understand that we can be saved, through Jesus, we understand that he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life, and we can't come to God but by him, and there's one God, one mediator, and that is Christ Jesus. So that's enough right there to help us to understand why we need Jesus. Now, why did Jesus come to earth? That's the first question. Why did he die on the cross? That's the second question. Now, he came and did all that he did to bring us into a relationship with God. You know, a relationship is something that has to be built up. Or it's something many times that we have to create. And remember the example that we talked about how you might be afraid to approach a young lady, approach a young man, because you want to have a relationship with them, not a temporal relationship, not a quick, just sexual relationship, but you actually want to know them so that you can be a life partner with them in marriage as a man and a woman and a woman and a man. So he came and did all that he did to bring us into a relationship with the Father. <clears throat> Now, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians, if you want to write this down, 5 and 19, that for God in Christ reconciling, we're going to talk about that word, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. See, this is what John 3 and 16 and 17 is so powerful of a script because not only did he so love the world that he gave himself, that he manifested himself as a son of man, but he didn't even come to condemn us first. He didn't even come to judge, judge us. He come to reconcile us. He come to bring us back to him in right relationship because of our sin nature, because of our ungodly behavior. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself to no longer counting people's sins against them. Now, when you're reconciling something, you have to understand what that means. To reconcile something means that you are uh, restoring. You're changing. So God wants to restore us to the original image that he created us to be in because Adam and Eve distorted the, the vision. You know, you, you ever seen a funny mirror? You ever been to a circus and you went in one of those mirrors and your body look all woozy like, oh, you know, you, you, ever, you ever been seen one of those move, those mirrors where you stand and your body look all crazy and that's a distorted image. And that's what, that's what the enemy allowed, that's what Adam and Eve allowed the enemy to do is to tell them you'll be as God. They didn't, they didn't see the real love that God had when he gave them all of these trees to eat from except one. So disobedience caused them to distort the image. But God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, he died for the ungodly. But they distorted the image, so God had to restore it through sacrificing that lamb and sacrificing that animal and covering them with animal skin. To show this is how the atonement for so love in the world is going to happen, and it did happen, and a resurrection have to happen after it. And now you can receive God's spirit within your mind, within your life, because he wants to restore and change your life. So God reconciled. In other words, mending a broken relationship. He's mending a broken relationship with God. Primary point is for us as believers, as those of you that are not believers, his primary point is to mend a broken relationship. The Bible says that all of us have a problem, and it's called sin. It's called missing the mark, missing the path, 
missing the way, missing the truth, missing who would have all men to be saved. It's called the one who wants us to be in agreement with him. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That we, we, we're not honoring God the way he wants to be honored until we not only just say, I believe in Jesus, not only just say, oh, how I love Jesus, but to demonstrate it in a changed life. That means that sins that I used to practice, that was habitual, that was contrary to God, because I'm the changed man, because I've been restored. Not a, re, not a temporary restoration, not a, a temporary restoring or a, temple, a temporary restoration or a temporary restore, restoring but a restoring that constantly changes day by day. I'm renewed more and more. Not only do I not smoke no more, not only do I not drink no more, but my whole thinking is changing day by day. When I start doubting God, when I start disobeying God, when he tells me to do certain things, call certain people, uh, respond a certain way, and I don't, I can still be restored and renewed because now I understand that he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the light. So I can be mended back together. So to be mended in the term that we're talking about, it's not a temporary fixing, but it's a sticking to type of mending. You know, we want to cling to Jesus. James said it real good. He said, if you draw now to God, God God is drawn out of you. When we mend to something, we stick to it, that means we connect with it even more. We connect with it even more. So according to the scriptures, when rejecting God over and over, he will allow one to live as they please. Why we need Jesus? Because he wants to he wants to say, he wants to cleanse, he wants to deliver, he wants to change, he wants to restore. He wants to use you to shine for him to bring other people out of a dark world. But when we reject God over and over, he will allow one to live as they please. Now they had they have a paper with all the scriptures on that I'm reading to you. So they're gonna be able to go home and read these scriptures as well. But let me say it one more time. When Rejecting God over and over, he will allow you to live as you please. Now, if you will turn with me to Romans chapter number one, starting at verse number 18. Because talking about why we need a person, the one and only God, and giving you the definition of why we need him and the definition of need, we have to make sure we let the scriptures speak for themselves. And we gave you a thorough understanding of who is the way, the truth, and the life, what is good and acceptable, agreeable with him. And now we want you to you don't understand we gave you an example of how people have to be determined to fulfill certain needs in their life. So now we want to talk about when you reject God over and over and over. He's going to allow you to live as you please. Now look at Romans chapter number 1, verse number 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So that means we need him because we live in an ungodly way, in a way that's the opposite of God. You know, like people are anti god anti-Christ, they, they totally anti-God, they don't believe Jesus is manifesting the flesh, they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, they don't believe any of that. But the wrath of God, we're going to talk about that word wrath, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who will hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, you want to note this if you care to. The wrath of God means the anger the punishment, consequential results of wrath, which is the principle of sowing and reaping. So the wrath of God is the anger of God. And the results of it is, the principle of it is, sowing and reaping. Now when we say consequential, we mean the results. The results of ignoring God. The results of of living an ungodly life, an unrighteous life, not righteousness your way, but God's righteousness. It's a con con consequential result, and which is the principle. When I say the principle, that means that when we ignore God, 
When you choose not to serve God, then you deal with the principles, the law, the standard, and the attitude of sowing and reaping. So the law of sin and death is your law. The standard of unrighteousness is your law. The attitude of ungodliness is your law. And so the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, which we say is the sowing and reaping. So when we talk about sowing, that means to introduce yourself to something. Before you can plant something, you have to first get familiar with how to plant it. And so when you're talking about what sort of a man soweth, that shall he reap, that means what have we introduced ourselves to because it's causing you to either realize you need to change or it's causing you to realize you don't want to change. It's causing you to be satisfied with what you have planted or it's causing you to want to pull up and uproot what you have planted. So when we're talking about the wrath of God, we're talking about what you're sowing and reaping. And when I say it's when you're sowing something, that means you're introducing yourself to something. To sow something means to make known. So because once you plant something and it begins to flourish and it begins to grow, then it begins to make known. So when you're sowing something, you're presenting it, you're announcing it, you're creating it. When you're sowing a seed and you're planting it, then it spreads. And this is why we need to understand that we are sowing seeds of sin before we ever think about sowing seeds of righteousness. We are sowing the seed of pleasing self and benefiting self and getting for self more than we ever was thinking about introducing ourselves to the purpose of God, to the righteousness of God. But because God so loved the world, because we understand that God wants to change our life, now we want to go in another way. So when, you, when, true, repent, when true repentance occurs, one really understands why they need Jesus. When you're really ready to turn from everything and turn not just to anything, when you're ready to turn from everything and turn to the one and only way, to the one and only truth, to the only one and only life, then you begin to understand this is real repentance. Real repentance recognizes that it needs to turn and change completely God's way. And that's why being in church is so important. That's why being up under leaders is so important. Just like that's why it's so important for children to be raised up in a house with a standard. A house with laws, a house with principles, a house that will sow and reap into you discipline. Parents that will sow and reap into you chastisement. Parents that will sow and reap into you through praying and you seeing them praying, learning how to pray. All of these things are a process because this is what God wants us to realize. This is how we need to turn to him. So once you really understand why you need Jesus, salvation becomes a sowing and reaping process. Now you've been introduced to a changed life. Now you've been introduced to scriptures, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Now you are able to introduce yourself. Now you are able to present yourself, to announce in prayer to God, Lord, I want to be new. Lord, I want to be changed. Lord, I want to be different. Now you understand the real need. Now you know how to sow. You sow, Jesus say, blessed are they that mourn. When you cry out to God, when you plead with God, when you ask for mercy from God, then happy you can be. So salvation becomes a sowing and reaping process. Listeners, salvation is a reaping and sowing process. You start planting through repenting. You start planting through confessing. You start reaping through power. You reap through a new spirit. You reap through our new birth. You reap through applying and reading what Jesus told his apostles to do in the book of Acts and how he told them where to go and wait and how they was filled with God's power. Because see, you have to understand, even though Jesus sold into them, when the harvest time came, like they thought they was gonna be okay, they denied him. But he sold into them. But once Jesus was resurrected and they went to the upper room, once when the day of Pentecost had fully come and they was on one accord and they all began to speak another tongue as the Spirit of God gave them utterance, they began to reap a new mind. And so what Peter did, he went right back out on, not back out, he on that feast day, on that day, which is those seven holy holidays that they celebrated, you can learn about Leviticus 23, he began to stand on the balcony and preach Jesus because he knew who was the way. He knew who was the truth. He knew who was the life. 
And he said, men and brethren, that same Jesus whom you have crucified is both Lord and Savior. And so he, he understood the need. And then they realized, whoa, we need Jesus. And so the scriptures say their hearts was pricked. They was cut. They was hurt that they crucified the Savior of the world. And Peter said, it's okay. Because it's just like going back to that scripture. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. For Christ Jesus came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he said, repent, each and every one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to let everything rest right there because we went into chapter John, chapter number three, and we didn't even get into the essence of the context of the scripture, which Jesus was really dealing with a religious ruler by the name of Nicodemus. And he was really dealing with a ruler who needed to know who was a Pharisee, who was very legalistic, and he was very caught up on the Old Testament Mosaic law. And Jesus was really, really working with him to understand who he really is and to understand that he must be born of the water and of the spirit. So until next time, we're going to pick this back up, why we need Jesus. We thank you for tuning in so much to Disciples for Jesus, Ministry of the Apostolic Faith. We are located at 1002 Four Season Boulevard in Aurora, Illinois. Our services start at 2 p.m. and we are asking you to come on out and join us in fellowship. Jesus loves you and we do too. God bless you until next time. We thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the message, Why We Need Jesus. We're going to ask you if you'd be as kind to hit the like button and share so that we can move up on the YouTube algorithm that we will be able to put out more messages and reach more people in the city of Aurora as well as wherever they are tuning in at. And we just want to say unto you until next time, we appreciate you so much for tuning in to Disciples for Jesus Ministry. And we know that you're going to be praying for us. And we invite you to go to our website, which is disciplesforjesus.org. And on that website, we do have our Zelle account as well as our um, Cash App account. And if you care to sow a seed into the ministry, it will definitely be a blessing because we are seeking for a permanent location where we can have a building that we'll be able to do the things that we desire to do. Right now, we're not in our own building, but we thank God for where we're at because, again, as I said at the beginning, we will not despise small beginnings. And we will trust the Lord with all of thine heart and lean not to thy own understanding. We ask that you will pray for us in Jesus' name. Until next time, God bless you. Amen.